We met several cattle producers who are not only dedicated to caring for their land and cattle, but are also willing to take on leadership roles that benefit all of agriculture. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Kate Maher visited Virginia to spend time with one of those leaders, who's back home now after serving in the top conservation job at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'm a little biased, but I would say the Shenandoah Valley here is probably one of the most beautiful spots in the entire country. Um, we're located about 100 miles southwest of Washington, D.C., the western portion of Virginia, between the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Allegheny Mountains. It's about a 100 mile stretch of just some amazing farmland. On a chilly spring morning in central Virginia, Valley Pike Farm is where we find Matt Lohr, the former chief of USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. Matt grew up here, and after his time at NRCS, he returned to carry on the family farming tradition. So Valley Pike Farm is a century farm here in Virginia, meaning it's been in the family for a hundred continuous years. And we actually established the operation in the late 1880s. So some of my earliest memories were uh, working on the same land side by side with my grandfather and my father, and really cherish those uh, early memories of hard work and determination and what it takes to make an operation succeed. Currently we're 250 acres. We have four broiler houses that we contract with Pilgrim's Pride, raise about 750,000 broiler chickens a year. Uh, we have about 180 head of feeder cattle that we background from April until October. And then 100 acres or so of pasture and 100 acres of crop ground that we do a corn soybean rotation. Oh boys, you're okay, come on. So Matt, in Virginia, it's a pretty heavy cow-calf state and you're running stockers. When do you bring them, bring them in? When do you buy them and where do you get them from? Yeah, so we're, we're blessed here in the, where I live in the Shenandoah Valley. We've got probably five or six uh, livestock auction barns all around. And so we start buying towards the middle of March and April and uh, within a couple of weeks, usually we can get enough. We, we buy 180 for three truckloads. And uh, so we bring them in around 600 pounds. And as you can see, we've got lots of luscious green grass here in the valley. So we'll uh, basically let them graze and give them mineral and treat them when they get sick. And hopefully they'll get about 200 pounds gain on them. And we'll sell them in October typically. And you talk about the green grass here. It's, it's also really hilly and, and even rocky. So it's really not suited for crop production. Cattle can really use this ground. Exactly. So. On our farm, out of 250 acres, it's split about half and half, crop to pasture. But yeah, you can look out here and see, they don't call it Rockingham County for nothing. There's lots of rocks, which uh, certainly it works well for, for grazing livestock, but certainly you can't crop anything like this. Even with the rocky ground and other challenges, Matt has worked hard to try to build up soil health, and he's used cover crops to provide additional grazing options for his stalker cattle. Matt uh, and his family have always grown cover crops here on the cropland um, since, I, since I've been working with them, like I said, since 2005, 2006. Then Matt kind of took it to the next level and uh, put livestock in on it. And that's another thing we've identified through some of our soil health campaigns and practices is uh, that when you can incorporate livestock into a system, you kind of help speed up the nutrient uh, cycling processes. So it's kind of a win-win for Matt. Um, as far as benefit in the soil, it's definitely a good thing. But it's also given his uh, cattle here on the farm, his stalker cattle, some good early spring forage. Uh, and that, the, the other thing I, I like about it is it, it's, it's letting his pasture fields that are cool season uh, perennials rest a little bit and get to growing while the cattle are here eating this, this forage. So cover crops, I think, are really one of the hallmarks to soil health. It's so important to make sure that there's something growing in that soil all year round. Um, we plant a variety of cover crop mixes depending on um, what time of the year we plant. Following our sweet corn, early varieties, we like to plant our tillage radishes, which do a great job of helping to break up soil compaction. These radishes get huge and they're really fascinating to see as they grow and expand and break up the soil. The beauty of that too is then we're able to graze it in the springtime. You guys have really done a nice job of making it fit for what works for you and for your environment. And that's really an important part of keeping a uh, farm sustainable too, isn't it? You're right. You know, no operation is the same. And uh, by looking to see what fits and what works. And for us, uh, the, the poultry, the cattle, the crops, we do 20 acres of sweet corn that we're able to, to grow and, and retail at a, at a roadside stand. It's been another component that works well. So that's the beauty of American agriculture. We're diverse, uh, no operation is exactly the same. 
but it's really all about feeding a, a growing nation and a growing world and being sustainable for that future generation. So to me, what's been really exciting with this whole journey of sustainability is how everything we do on this farm all ties together. We're not a huge operation. I mean, 250 acres in many parts of the country um, is like a, a small garden, right? But the cattle and the poultry and the crops, they all have a place, they all tie together. The poultry manure following our, our nutrient management plans can provide nutrients um, to the soils, which can help crops grow, help grasses grow, help sustain the livestock. And it's just really exciting to be involved in an operation where everything ties together. Beyond the conservation practices he's using to care for his land today, Matt has also taken action for the long term. Knowing that Virginia is a highly populated state, the Lohr family has taken steps to protect their farm for generations to come. There's nothing more that I want than to see my kids and my grandkids be able to continue farming this land. And so back in 2017, uh, we placed the entire farming operation under permanent conservation easements. And what that means is basically the land will always stay in agriculture. It can never be developed for a, a Walmart supercenter. Uh, just behind me um, is a major interstate. And so we are right at a major intersection. So one day there would be pressures for some type of development here. But it's important to, to know, to me to know now that this farm will always stay a farm. And it's a business and we, we try to be profitable. We try to you know, leave the land better than we found it and uh, teach that next generation just how important uh, agriculture really is. Uh, it's been a privilege to be out here today. What a treat to get what out to the beautiful <laughs> Shenandoah Valley and see green grass and yeah. cows grazing and, and just know that uh, it's going to stay that way. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we're proud to show it off. We're proud of what we've done and uh, really excited to be able to promote conservation because there's a lot of farmers out there that maybe don't really understand or they haven't seen the, the financial benefits, even the environmental benefits. So by people being able to see firsthand, hopefully it'll inspire some other folks to, to want to jump in. And there's 3,000 NRCS offices across the country <laughs> full of 10,000 employees that are ready and willing to assist producers who want to address some of their, their resource concerns. Once an NRCS chief, always That's an right. NRCS That's chief, right. my friend. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't pay me to say that. So. <laughs> In Virginia Cattle Country, I'm Kate Maher, reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen.